get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, the founders of Zapier, Aweber, RxBar, which ended up selling to Kellogg for $600 million. Eugene, uh, check out that interview. P90X founder Tony Horton talks about how he made money as a street mine before he sold hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, Atari founder Nolan Bushnell talked about how, you know, he was Steve Jobs' mentor, and Steve offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no to that and, and many more of uh, founders overcoming big challenges in life and business. Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners or customers. We do it through a couple done-for-you services. One is an event solution for large conferences and software companies. Some of the actual SEM rush Staff came to one of our past ones at Retail X. It was good to have them there. Um, we have a done for you podcast solution, which, in my opinion, is the best thing I've done for my business and my life. It's helped me connect with best friends, with referral partners, clients, uh, you know, everyone, um, and a lead generation. But you know, our greater purpose, Eugene, is our mission is really because John realized that both of our grandfathers were an inspiration to myself and him, and my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. He escaped Nazi Germany, and him and his brothers were the only people to survive from their family, and John's grandfather at the same time was a B-17 captain and pilot who flew 35 missions over Nazi Germany. So we decided to put together a veteran entrepreneur scholarship, um, and so if anyone goes to rise25.com slash mission, rise25.com slash mission, you can apply. If you're a veteran or you know a veteran, send it to them. We do you know, uh, all expense paid tri- from all expense paid trip to one of our VIP events and conferences to just a comp ticket to the conference, whatever we can do. Um, so check that out. I'm excited to introduce today's guest. We have Eugene Levin. And if it's if you're a true Russian, you'd know how to pronounce his name, uh, Yevgeny. And uh, he was one of the first investors to spot SEM Rush. SEM Rush, if you don't know, they started in 2008, has over 4 million users using a variety of their SEO tools. And after Eugene joined the company as a chief strategy officer, he helped to quadruple the company um, and, uh, and the revenue and raised over $40 million from tier one investors. Uh, Eugene started his career as a VC and was partnered at Foresight Ventures and Target Global. Foresight Ventures was ranked among the top 10 Russian VC firms by Forbes. And Eugene was in charge of the U.S. pipeline at Target Global. They invested in a number of notable companies that you've probably heard of, Blue Apron, which IPO'd, Lyft, and Juno, which got acquired. Um, SEM Rush also has a free product for Amazon sellers. Um, It's called Sellerly.com. You know, you better grab it now because I'm I'm not sure how long it'll be free. I know Eugene says it'll always be free, but you know what? You know, anything that I think, you know, when companies charge, they can actually keep up with it and and make it better. So we'll find out why it's free, but go to sellerly.com and it basically helps split testing uh, for your Amazon listings, which everyone wants because it's all about conversion. So Eugene, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, really great to be here. And uh, yeah, really appreciate the introduction. Couldn't say it better. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah. I'm excited to dig in. You know, I'm fascinated by your background, um, and there's a couple things that we're going to dig into. And we will talk about Sellerly, but um, you grew up in Russia, so uh, right? Not exactly. You I'm didn't. actually from Belarus. Belarus. So you grew up in Belarus. Tell me about what it was like growing up there, and wow. what you wanted to do when you grew up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Listen, that's. Um, that's interesting. It was really tough. I mean, uh, unbelievably. When, when I tell stories about my childhood, people think that I make them up, but they're actually all all true. Yeah, and, like uh, what? Like you know, um, I'm I'm relatively young, so 
when Soviet Union collapsed, I was five. So, so I was old enough to understand the whole thing, but like not all and old enough to really kind of suffer from it mentally, like, you know, right. um, but in, in general, like a lot of poverty, uh, a lot of unemployment, um, like at one moment, the whole life of millions and millions of really uh, good people changed. Um, and it, you know, it hit, hit harder, uh, people like doctors and teachers, even though they still had their their job, like salaries was was so low, it was almost impossible to make decent living. So, so many people, for example, um, had to grow their food on their um, kind of kind of uh, country houses. So, so almost well, almost every family in in that part of the world had kind of some small house in in the countryside. And and a lo- and some land, so so almost every household was farming, not like you know, uh, you know today people do do kind of farming uh, to kind of have organic food, really good food. So so we had to do those things to just you know have survive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's like. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't say like you know we would we would starve if we if we didn't have it, but we would not have like uh, you know fresh vegetables, for example. So, um, so it was, it was complicated time, and uh, to the point, yeah, when when I was you know six and seven, I learned how to actually grow food, like you know potatoes and tomatoes, and and today it kind of sounds funny to me, and as I said, I was really young, I didn't understand the whole complexity of the situation but today if i was told that my kids have to work on the on on some you know farm um to to grow food to to you know not to sell it not to make money but just to you know to to have access to this type of food i would be terrified but that you know at that point of time it was fine uh so so really you know what are some of the stories at that time? Like, what is poverty? You know, for just if you were to paint the picture for people who can't fully, it's hard to comprehend, right? If you're not living it, what were some of the stories you tell your friends that they can't believe are true? <laughs> okay, that, that it it really will sound a little bit crazy, and, and you may think bad about my parents, but they they're awesome people, and I really really love them. And, and I, they, I don't know them, so I can't think bad about them. So. <laughs> But but the example is so so you know when you when you plant potatoes, you first need to plow like you know to to make to make uh, ground ready for potatoes. Right. So to plow usually you know use horses or, or some other you know draft animals, um, and we didn't really have any horses or anything. So so we would just uh, you know pull the plow ourselves. And, and to pull the plow, you need one strong person to kind of push it down. And then some other people have to kind of drag pull it. it. So drag it. Yeah. So so the strong people were usually like men. And then then who else kind of remains to kind of drag it? So kids were dragging it. So it sounds a little bit, you know. So you were the horse in this situation. I was the horse. Yeah. So. Hey, listen, you do what you have <laughs> That's to what do. Now- yeah. yeah. So that, that's why now, like when when people say like you know I work hard, no, not really. That time I work hard. Now it's just relaxing. Yeah, it gives you. You think it gives you a certain perspective? Yeah. Do you think that motivated I, you? Because when I was doing research about you, Eugene, it seemed like you're always looking for a specific opportunity. You know, opportunity to you know make more revenue. Essentially, do you think that's given you like this this edge about you that because you, you had to plow the fields um, and and you don't I don't know is there something driving you away from that that poverty? That that was a big factor in in um, in the path that I took and choices that that I've made. Mm-hmm. Um, for first first of all, I. You know, from from the very early childhood, I, I understood I I never want to kind of have physical work, like like job that that right. would require a lot of 
you know? It's like PTSD. <laughs> You'll have like post-traumatic stress, like take yeah. you back to where you were. Yeah. So, so I wanted to be engineer because it seemed like the easiest kind of way to get there. There are tons of engineers. There are, there are some other office, you know, jobs, but demand seemed to be growing very high for engineering. So, um, so I went to uh, actually study IT, um, and and I worked in the college as an engineer um, and manager, and so so and and then and then I think you know the desire kind of to to have financial stability um, at you know above all. I think that would, would have driven my career because I was, you know, in terms of tasks that I was solving, I was happy as an, you know, engineer or project manager. Um, but it was very clear that this type of job will not give me financial security fast enough. Right. Like maybe when I'm 50 and I worked as an engineer or project manager for, for a you know, long time, maybe at that point I'll have some financial security, mm. but it's not something, you know, if you if you if you work for someone you're not partner in a business in general it's very hard to get financial independence and technically the first opportunity that i had to be working closer to entrepreneurs um and and have some ownership in the business i i was always taking it um even even at the cost of like some short-term uh financial gains for example Almost at all my jobs, I always negotiated for lower salary and higher uh, ownership equity. in the business. Yeah, higher equity. It was it was like people people were surprised because you know usually it happens you know different. The opposite. Way. But I say, yeah. The opposite. But I would say like okay, this is a good paycheck. Um, how much more equity you would give me if paycheck gets lower? <laughs> yeah. Um, it just says you have so, confidence in yeah. your abilities, right? I mean, you have confidence in the company, but you have confidence in your abilities to, like you did with SEM Rush, right? Quadruple revenue, raise money, you know, and make I mean, it bigger. I I wouldn't take you know credit for my, myself for everything. Yeah, of course. It, you know, SEM Rush. First of all, I think I think I I can take credit for spotting SEM Rush. That's I think. Be people, you know, like even three months after I joined. I started talking to people, uh, you know, about the company that I've joined, and they were shocked, like how they missed it, how everyone missed it. But it was such a, such you a great potential. company. Yeah, it it was unbelievable. Um, when when I first, you know, started pitching them an idea of me investing money into their business, there was no kind of real VC type of PNL. So they were managing business in a very different way, not not the way venture capital investors expect people to, to manage business. So we sit for a couple of weeks uh, with, with founders and we've built first framework. And once I saw this, I, I was, you know, in love. I very quickly realized that's probably one of the best businesses I've ever seen. Why? Like in, you what know, did you see? Like un- unbelievable unit economics, like instant customer acquisition cost recovery. So, so it's it's like it's like you're spending money to acquire a user, you get this money back in in two weeks. Wow! So un- unbelievable unit economics. What did you see typically with like Lyft uh, and Blue Apron? What was what was typical there? It's, it it really it really depends, but like I would say for SaaS company, let's take like Lyft for example. That, I, I can't remember from top of okay. my head. Also, not sure if I'm, you know, can legally disclose right, real yeah. number. If I can can remember this, um, but uh, you know, if even even if you look at the the public uh, filings now, I think you can get some understanding that their recovery is still above one year. So, which is which is fine if you can. Um, Page story of expansion story where people use your product more frequently over time and and you have stable retention which i think lyft is is able to do they they have very healthy cohorts for business of their type right uh but yeah i mean 
for for SaaS, anything that is below 12 month is is considered very 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 good. Right. But we had just instant. So so I realized, okay, we we can spend much more money. We still will be you know below this 12 month recovery, and we still would be considered to be awesome business. So we we did you know many many things like this. So. So we started investing more in digital marketing. We started investing more in customer success. So provide people more service so they stay longer. We started investing in sales so we could go up market, start talking to bigger brands. Today we work with seven out of top 10 world biggest um, AdWords spenders. And we work with 25% of Fortune 500 companies. It was not really the case, uh, you know, years ago. but. But yeah, the, the, the trick is we were so good in terms of product that even, you know, once we started investing more in, in sales and marketing, we still were not able to get, you know, to the levels where unit economics doesn't look good because technically you invest in sales, you start expanding your customers, um, and that improves your unit economics. So now you're spending more, but your economic unit economics also improved. Your average check improved, so you can spend more one more time. So we are, we are still kind of in in the process of um, you know reaching that limit where where you know uh, we cannot spend uh, more revenue or more um, dollars per per customer per new customer. Uh, we still we still cannot reach that point. Mm, it's like good. every time we invest more. It kind of goes up a little bit, then goes down because efficiency kicks off, and and you, you're starting to see benefit of this. Actually, yeah, what else sure. did you see at that time, Eugene? So you saw, and and I, I imagine when you went to them and you did these um, economics, they didn't have that those metrics in place. Did they even know that was going on? That they would they would make the money back in two weeks. Uh, I, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I, else did I, you I, see? I, I think I think intuitive, yeah. intuitively they, they, they understood yeah. that this is extremely good business. <laughs> yeah. But but not but but they could not like quantify why exactly it's such a good yeah. business. So what else did you see when you ran the numbers that you knew this was yeah. an amazing business? I mean, profitability was also like at that point, I, unbelievable. Especially if you think about combination of growth and profitability. So, so very low marketing spend, very high growth. As a result, you have a lot of profitability, which for me meant uh, much more room to invest in R and D. And and SEM Rush always had awesome product. It's it's technically it's a product first company from the very beginning and and today as well. Um, but kind of when when I saw this profitability, I would say, okay, we need to hire as many engineers as as we can mm. because and we should go into into new kind of product categories and diversify uh, our offering. And yet again, we did this in terms of in terms of product diversification. Um, you know, 10 years ago, we started as SEM competitive intelligence product and keyword research product, which is relatively um, small niche. It's, it's very important part of the marketing stack, but, but it's relatively small niche. And today we cover absolutely all aspects of online visibility, be it search engines, social media. We can show you competitive intelligence for direct traffic, for referral traffic, we can tell who are their affiliates. We have amazing backlink, in, backlink index. We monitor brand mentions. Uh, we help you to optimize visibility in directories. So if, if you're a local business, so we, we technically cover everything about your company that happens outside of your website. Mm -hmm. So so how people learn about you, how they find you, what they see, you know, in search when they Google something relevant for you. Um, yeah, we, we do we do it all. Um, and now you, know, you do we, we Amazon. Have a lot, and now we do Amazon because that's just for me continuation of of this approach. So Amazon is not my website. I have really limited control over what's going on in this. It's it's to a large level of extent search engines. Very few people 
in the world know search engines the way we do. And, and uh, in, term, in terms of technology, I believe we have absolutely best technology. And um, combining this, this knowledge about search engines and this technology that we've built over the last 11 years and, uh, and, and uh, apply it to new kind of sort of search engine, um, we believe that would make a lot of sense for us as a company from from product and technology point of view. But as I said, what's more important, we are solving real problem of people who want to run, run, uh, you know, online business. Yeah. Um, and, um, and we, we are thinking that in general, we should be agnostic to, to the way people want to sell their stuff. If they want to sell through social media, we need to be helping them to do it through social media. If it's, you know, more like search engine optimization play for Google, we will have products that help them optimize for that. And then if their choice is to sell through platforms, you know, like Amazon, um, we should help them to do it as well. As I said, the, for, for, for us, the main aspect is, is online visibility, how people find things that you are selling. If you choose right. to go through Amazon, we will help you to find or to kind of connect with people who want to buy things through Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, as we were talking before, you know, we run you know, events, VIP events for large sellers. And um, Sellerly seems like an amazing tool. Um, and I feel like, I don't know, it's sort of like a free version. And we'll talk about why it's free. Uh, and if you think it'll ever not be free. Uh, I was actually surprised it's free. And even your pricing on SEM Rush is very reasonable for like a business. You know, it starts at like $100 a month and goes on up depending on the features, but um, it's sort of like a free, I don't know if you're familiar with a visual website optimizer for websites where you basically can make changes and it basically tells you what the conversion is and you can switch to that higher converting, whatever you split tested. It, it's sort of subtly, I uh, picture it's like a free version of that for Amazon, your Amazon listings, right? Yeah, in yeah. a nutshell, in a nutshell, that's yeah. that's exactly uh, what what it does. You can you can play with technically anything from price to pictures to description. Um, you can you can try to optimize both for rankings and conversions. Yeah. So sometimes you would need to include certain keywords to rank for specific, yeah. uh, you know, keywords. Yeah. Uh, but uh, sometimes you maybe just want to optimize for conversion rate. Which is yeah. also fine. In this case, you would change only pictures, for example. Um, so, so in a nutshell, we we thought. Yeah. Why is it free? Like, you mean you're like oh, okay. one? You're know, raising forty million dollars. You're quadrupling right. revenue. Why? Why did you decide on free for this? So, we we the the way we see this is, um. It's it's like, and by the way, that that really resonates with with uh, what you said about our core product being uh, only hundred dollars per month. But that's premium version. We also have free version. Technically, you can try everything we do for free. Hmm. Um, we have customers who use us for really long periods of time before they ever upgrade to paid version. Hmm. We are big believers in in freemium model in a way that that the power first users deliver like to pay. value yeah. first yeah but first you show value first you, first you prove that that people need to pay um, and and then when they when they in this when they have this understanding they will pay so and and also the, the kind of trade off is okay so how much stuff you can give for free knowing that there are real costs of running the business, mm -hmm. especially everything that is related to data, you know, infra, you know, there, there is a lot of infrastructure. So our core product is unbelievably expensive in terms of data assets and, and server infrastructure, um, literally uh, over, you know, $10 million. I, I don't want to give specific number, but that's, you know, Low, lower end. Uh, so, so those types of businesses. There's real say, cost. You know, yeah, totally. Is yeah, there is a real cost. So, so for us, it's always okay. So, what's what's the balance? How much stuff we can give for free before we actually start asking them for money, depending on kind of what costs we 
we have associated with it. And then for for this product for for split testing, we thought costs are actually not that high, and then. Um, Technically, this is one of those products that just ev- everyone just needs this. Yeah. What, what um, will it escalate into? Because I don't see like um, a larger tiered version. Or is there? Right. So right now there is no larger yeah. tiered version. And um, yeah, maybe maybe one day um, there will be larger tiered version for someone who wants to to run, let's say, very specific types of tests. Maybe... You know, they have 20,000 SKUs and they want to run uh, not not individual tests on every product, but they want to test uh, kind of product page patterns. So they want to update, uh, update instantly 20,000 pages. And that might be eventually a premium feature. But for a basic feature, um, we just felt it's, it's, it's it doesn't make sense to charge people money uh, for for you know for this basic yeah. product yeah um, it's I, I, I would I think the good comparison is Wix so so on Wix everyone can build website for free because essentially it's like you know ha- ability to have your own website is pretty much like like you know modern day you know human rights you just deserve <laughs> the right to have your website and we thought okay that's know, coming from deserve... someone who had to plow fields just to uh get food but yeah it's a different perspective yeah. now <laughs> so yeah so yeah we, th- we thought like this is the same but yeah i think if you're if you're a much much bigger company eventually we'll start thinking about features that make your life easier and maybe those features would be would right. be premium right uh, you know if you don't want to talk about you know I don't want to gloss over the investment piece. You helped them mm-hmm. raise forty million dollars from investors. Yeah. Talk about that process, the the difficulty, challenges of it, and then I want to hear what you know. What do they do with the money at that point? Because it's a, seems like it's. I think early on, I was wa- was reading that they didn't even want to take your money. Right? They didn't. Yeah. They so. Didn't. You had to like force them to take your money. <laughs> uh, didn't take my money, ever. So so I I had to go go work for for uh, founders, for for the company. Um, so that was the only way for me to get into. Uh, and um, you know then over over time, uh, the first question was exactly um, so why do we need money? How we how we spend them? Right. And and we we spent quite quite considerable amount of time to kind of plot this R and D roadmap and, and marketing expansion and, um, geographical expansion. Um, then, then we, we started thinking about, uh, having sales, more salespeople. Um, we, we had some, but, but not very few. So, so we started scaling sales. We brought, uh, our chief revenue officer, uh, Del Humanic, who before that, before us was running um, uh, world biggest uh, Yellow Pages business. So, so he had an experience of managing billions of dollars in revenue versus what we had at this point. But we wanted to have like something with that type of you know experience. Uh, starting scaling sales teams, sales uh, you know strategies uh, by default kind of have more friction so they're less efficient so that's when you start needing a little bit of money because you know you hire people they don't deliver results from day one so so that that's more kind of cost um yeah. you know efficient uh thing then then you know in, in another 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 reason to raise money is what kind of uh, risks you're willing to take if if you don't have a lot of money on the balance sheet? So, so it was also helpful in a way that we could do experiments without thinking, you know, if it fails, you know, how we pay salary to our, to our employees, um, and and that you know spirit of ability to run experiments it gives a lot of stability uh, there. 
it, yeah, it gives, but the pe people start being afraid of trying things, which yeah. is crucial for any business that, that wants to get to kind of next level. Uh, you, ju you just have to try a lot of things. You can't be lucky all the time. Some, it's, it's, it's like extremely, extremely bright people. They will be right more often than, than less bright people. But still not a high percentage. It's, out, yeah, and ultimately it's just a numbers game. You just try a lot of things, and um, and uh, yeah, having having kind of this this um, money that that's on the balance sheet gave us gave us kind of ability to do more experiments as well. I mean, we all, we also now starting um, kind of corporate development, so so we probably will be acquiring some companies. Um, but that's, that was not really a yeah. primary goal. So are uh, you going to head that up also? Will you look at, since that's sort of your background? Yeah, that would be mostly, mostly yeah. what, uh, my area. Of what kind of companies? Yeah. Uh, technically anything that, that is relevant for our core audience. And, and our core audience are, at this point, professional marketers. Mm -hmm. Either, you know, that work either in agencies or in-house. Mm -hmm. um, so, so anything that would be relevant for them, as I said, we have we have really really diverse uh, set of tools, um, that, and you know, and we cover all aspects of online visibility management. So, uh, parts parts where we do not go are you know things that that are very crowded, you know things that happen on on your website. Technically, the oldest product categories like, uh, let's say, um, email marketing. So that this those things have been around kind of too long, too crowded. Doesn't and, and products are good. Like it doesn't make sense to go head to head, you know, versus Mailchimp. They 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 have a good product. We we prefer to kind of focus on underserved niches. Hmm. Um, what do you what do you consider underserved of, right now? Uh I mean, uh, a, a lot of a lot of areas. Um, what you know? Where would you like to start? Anywhere. Anywhere. Okay. Yeah. What do you think is underserved okay. now? So, if you if you think about about what's you know really re really you know missing there is. If you if you want to go from you know not doing any marketing, let's say you're a small business and, and you, you're not doing like any marketing, and you want to go from zero to like doing something, there is almost nothing that that can help you today, uh, you know, to get there. Like as I said, like even even SEM Rush, we we are you know there in terms of price, everyone can afford us. But we are still a uh, product for relatively sophisticated audience. We, we have small business owners. Don't get me wrong. We have a lot of them. We have bloggers. But those are kind of self-taught professionals. They, they're not doing marketing day to day, but their level is, is quite good um, because they've been doing it for themselves for a while. Um, but if you're like nowhere, like I just you know w woke up and decided I want to do something, uh, there are very few things that can take you from, you know, not doing anything to to starting getting on, you know, online online business, mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's where I see today a lot of a lot of opportunities, um, and uh, you know, one of the big problems there is. Um, you know, you technically need an expert to tell you where to start and what to do. And uh, when you just start business and you you don't have a lot of money, you don't have an expert. So, yeah. so, so that's one of those areas where we are uh, focusing now. Kind of, kind of, we we have we have all this data. We we have literally the whole map of the internet. We know how websites are connected. We know what ads they're running, what what they are posting on social media. We know what people watch, uh, you know, on on YouTube. We know, you know, um, 
even direct traffic for for almost every website in the world. Um, so what we are thinking now is, how do we give insights to people about kind of starting their online business from from traffic acquisition point of view? How we yeah. how we analyze this and, and give people that because things that work for for pizzeria does uh, do not work for um, let's say let's say someone who want to sell uh, uh, let's say um, art online and then if i want to buy something interesting in china and sell it on amazon or on my own website that's kind of also completely different yeah. case from, from online uh, marketing point of view um so yeah we are now thinking how we you know help people get from from not doing anything to actually doing business mm. online Eugene, so using, using all the yeah yeah sorry question you know thank you yeah um it's interesting. I just am curious. Yeah, I was curious of your thought process on what's underserved because obviously you guys are always developing tools, improving them, new tools um, to see kind of where the puck's going, not where it is. Um, what what were the challenges of raising money, and why why fi you know forty million as opposed to five, as opposed to ten, as opposed to fifty? Yeah. So so. We had much more demand than than supply. We didn't want to take any dilution. We were a profitable mm -hmm. company, uh, and uh, is that because of your connections, or because that's not typical? I would think, right? Demand supply. I mean, yeah, having uh, it just be so like so much demand, right? I mean, hard hard to say. I, I would say some part was coming through through my network. A lot of there was a lot of uh, kind of just um, kind of inbound interests. Hmm. Um, it was just they, they, you know, before I joined, they could not get any any traction in those conversations. Interest, I think, interest was there for 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 a while because people who used product and a lot of them are actually an investment community. Um, I, I personally learned about SEM Rush uh, because I was using it in due diligence process mm. a lot. So, so that was my go-to tool to check uh, marketing strategies that people are running. And um, it was very classic. People would go to me and say, "Hey, we have no competitors. We we, we do something extremely unique." And I would go say, "Okay." I would log in into hey, SEM Rush. Five minutes, you're like, you have thousands yeah. of competitors. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, it's not like you're, they're not just your competitors. They're trying to advertise for exactly same keywords. And if I go there, landing page tells me the same story you are telling me. So um, it was quite interesting. So I knew the product is awesome. And I think many people knew that product is awesome. But it was kind of hard to get into these conversations like we want to invest money in your company because founders would always say, yeah, thanks. We, we have money. We need to figure out, you know. Um, you know, our new product, we need to scale marketing. Thank you. We just really not have no time for that. And we don't know where to spend this money. So, mm. um, so th I think that was the, the case there. I think demand in general was, was there. And I think, I think once I joined the company and we started having more specific conversations and, and there was a way for them to move forward, then it kind of at some point, um, they couldn't. They couldn't visualize know, what they would spend the money on, so they're, you know, they didn't want to take it, which yeah, is, yeah, which yeah, is they, responsible. They did, yeah, know? they didn't want yeah. to. I mean, even after I joined, they didn't want to take money until we had a really good plan how to spend money. Um, so, but yeah, in terms of investment community, I think I think uh, once once we started actually talking to investors, then you know, investors talk with each other also, especially uh, kind of analysts, associates, they, they actually share pipeline with, with friendly firms. So at some point, I just saw like exponential growth in, in interest. Uh, you know, we would get three emails per day from people asking us to, to meet. Um, for some reason, all of them were saying that they're in, 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 you know, in Philly, we had 
headquarters in Philly back in the day. So, so uh, they were writing, yeah, we will be in Philly next week. Do you want to meet? And, uh, um, and yeah, we just started, at some point, we just started taking those meetings to uh, at least understand what was going on. We've been very uh, kind of picky with with the uh, you know people we wanted to work with so uh investors that we work with i think kind of best possible investors for this type of business um so so graycroft amazing firm uh you know founded by legendary 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 investor um they are one of the most active firms in marketing technology space. And, and they were one of those people were, you know, w- uh, with whom we, we met and they were telling us things about our business exactly the way we would tell those things. And, and it was like, okay, we see, we see it the same way. Uh, because usually you meet investors, you have to educate people about what you are doing. You have to explain, you know, the landscape, why you are better than your competitors and so on. But with Graycroft, actually, they said, like, you know, that they've ran a research and they believe we are the best product and they want to invest. And it was very fast also. Mm. And uh, and they immediately, you know, even before we closed, they started delivering value, you know, connecting us to people um was was really uh, a good, good process yeah um, and then ventures uh do, do you want it, to go through the whole no, go ahead yeah yeah okay so then eventures is um really global firm we wanted to be global company to sell across all possible countries we already had at that point customers in 180 something countries but we wanted to have kind of more meaningful presence there and and eventures is one of the most global firms we want to have their experience in build you know in in building global global presence and um and then we also have graycroft so we, with them we we had kind of you know personal connection uh you know before they invested and and um, they're, you know, they're actually not very um, well-known firm, but Sig- Sigler & Goff was um, first investor in company called EPAM that is now publicly traded company. Uh, but EPAM started as a, as a small outsourcing company in Eastern Europe. Hmm. So, so they had this experience of investing in Eastern, you know, c- company with a significant Eastern European presence and uh, helping them go public in the United States. And we wanted to have like this type of experience because at that point we still had tons of R&D in Eastern, Eastern Europe. Hmm. So Eugene, we were talking before we, we hit record and um, you know, we were talking about a couple of conferences and um, kind of as, as far as the e-commerce world goes. And you were saying, if you started an e-commerce company um, you found you would find that getting to a million dollars. Everyone talks about kind of that being the the mark that they're aiming for when they're first starting. You'd say, yeah, I probably hit that in let's say, you know, month, couple months. What would you do right now to start that company, um, and within a short period of time, get it to a seven figure mark? That, that, that's a good one. So Go. I, I was no, just <laughs> okay. Sure, sure. Okay, okay. So, um, so I uh, I think first 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 of all, I didn't say that it necessarily going to be very profitable. Business right. at the no, I I didn't say so. profitable. I said <laughs> yeah. Yes. So yes. we'll make that so, disclaimer. Yeah, but, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Not necessarily profitable. Yeah. I think. Um, and, and then I think the big difference is, is like, are we talking about kind of multi-channel or or Amazon yeah. or whatever way? Outside yeah. Okay. You do whatever. whatever you, so, yeah. The, the yeah. world is your oyster. How it's right. a blank slate. Right. right. So I would go with um, what's what's now called direct to consumer brands. Um, very limited choice of products, but products very specifically crafted to uh, to audience. 
in in a perfect case, uh, something reasonably repeatable. And then I would try to get on board some sort of strategic partner that has a lot of exposure for this audience within my network. Mm -hmm. Technically, may, probably the way I would, I personally would start, I would go and say, okay, who I know, who would work with me? And then I would go there and say, okay, what kind of audience do they have? And then I would go and say, okay, what, what those people would buy? And by the way, there are a lot of, I personally have access to a lot of data that would guide me through this decision and a lot of this also available through SEMrush. Um, so I would use a lot of software to kind of do research. Ultimately, once I have audience, I understand who can bring me to this audience. I will, and I understand kind of kind of supply side of this, how to get those products, which is actually the easiest part these you, days. You would go to the need first, the audience size, yes. and find the need first, and yeah. find the largest need and audience size first, and then yep. look to see what they need, and then go back to the supply side. And then go back to the supply, and I would be looking for, um, in in a perfect case, re repeatable you know repeatable purchases, so something that you can run out of. Um, like consumables of some sort. Consumables, yeah, of some sort, yeah. Um, I I would, you know, the, the, I think the first types of people, you know, audiences I would think about, um, um, women who are expecting. That would be my my probably first most interesting audience to think about, assuming I have the channel. Um, it's a very interesting audience in a way that um, many of those women, especially in Europe, um, when they're expecting, um, then they have some some time to kind of read things, to socialize with the same group of people. So it's, it's a kind of very interesting community. Hmm. Um, it's, uh, it's not, you know, there is not very long LTV, like, usually nine months max right but but then what's interesting once once this nine month period is over there is a bunch of other things you can sell into this audience so um yeah i, I would i would i would think about that group of, you know of people uh and it's it's relatively niche to the point where it's not going to be crazy competitive mm. you will be competing with you know with relatively old school businesses not that much marketing savvy yeah so so that probably would be a very interesting audience for me you know in terms of what you can sell to them i mean tons of things but but do you, you know i would i would just go to the you know forums and social media groups for for you know uh pregnant women and and just read everything and um find out what the and need just is try to yeah f find to find resonating topics i guess another interesting audience that i would think about is um uh you know um some specific uh group of uh kind of sport communities like people who are into combat sports or or some other types of sports mm. um there you can think about all yeah. types of uh consumables right it'd be a cool you know eugene it'd be a cool blog post like weekly blog posts from eugene you turn on your screen you're using sem rush or one of the tools and you do one what you think is a good opportunity market right you turn your screen on you use whatever sem rush you're like here's i would do this week would be um you know expecting you know moms and then you show some of the research and some of the opportunity the next week after that may be uh, combat sports and it would be interesting to see how you as uh, especially coming from your VC background seeing opportunities in companies seeing opportunities in markets and products you know uh, or something like that so that'd be cool I, that you know when when I when I retire I should definitely do that forget retire why I mean I mean you'd still be promoting SEM rush as a tool to do those those searches right so um Anyways, just a thought. Yeah, that, but, but no, we, we actually we actually thought about this uh, a couple times. We, we we would probably want to kind of do this more as a, as as a kind of 
uh, not not reality show, but like um, yeah. format where people actually build their business. Mm-hmm. Like like instead of me talking about hypothetical research, people actually do research. Actually go do. buy those. Exactly. Yeah, and actually, that would be I think more fun. Yeah. Uh, but also I think one 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 difference here is I think if you if you want to build sustainable business, like and and you don't have like those uh, initial connections. Then yeah, you go you go with with product like SEMrush and do research and do a lot of content marketing and build the audience. But I think my reference to this, you know, how to build business in two months would be I would go directly to people who own some audience in a way or you know have high exposure to this audience. And I would pitch partner them with them partner with me on whatever you know terms. And and um, that probably would allow me to have kind of really good jump start. Yeah, but totally. Not everyone has this opportunity, I guess. Well, so. I mean, you could always reach out for people you know or don't know. You'd find an inborn audience who maybe isn't selling maybe physical goods, maybe it's a digital product, and you'd partner with them and offer the the you know some kind of physical product to that existing audience. That makes sense. Okay, I could see that you doing that in a couple of weeks. We'll, we'll check back in three weeks. So, you know, <laughs> um, the the other thing you want to know is so right now if I had if I pinned you down and said you need to acquire a company this week, what kind of company would you acquire for SEM Rush? Um, interesting. So what? what I mean, I think I think one of the misconceptions about acquisitions is that people have to buy companies. It, it actually works the opposite. It's mm-hmm. like it's like by default, I don't want to buy anything unless I'm like hundred percent positive that I want to buy this. And it, it's like there is never pressure to buy anything. Like you know, if you if you read Warren Buffett's books, technically he explains that when you exp- in, invest. You know his way. That might be one of the laziest job ever. You just sit, and sometimes you just don't feel like you want to invest in anything. You just don't invest, and it's like not how you how your you know performance is measured, not by number of transactions, but the quality of transaction that you do. So there is never a pressure. But um, you know, thinking about what kind of verticals I'm interested in today, and why you know what I think is interesting in general in the market. I think today there is tons of things that uh, you know help you build high quality content if you want this. There are tons of things that help you to spread this content to um, you know your social media audience. If you if you don't have audience, uh, you can you can advertise plenty of products that solve this problem as well. We we also have products that do this. Um, I think that the missing part is. Uh, how to distribute content organically? Hmm. So um, it's it's really it's really hard, even if you have high quality content, um, because traditional traditional methods like you know I'll post something and people will pick it up that doesn't really work, especially if it's anything non hundred percent mainstream or you know viral video with kittens. Um, so if it's if it's anything even remotely B two B, you don't have you know organic exposure. No matter how interesting the topic is, so you actually need to talk to people and ask them to spread this. And especially right. when it comes to to bloggers and and media. So so there are some some things that that solve you know parts of the puzzles. For example, there are places that. Um, can do can do uh, you know outreach, let's say, effectively, you know, in a way that that they can automate emails. They, they can work, you work with templates to make those emails customizable and personalized. There are things that can do this. Uh, there are you know databases of contacts to you know relevant people you want want to reach out. But I don't think there are people who found this kind of holy grail. So yeah, I would, you know, if I had to buy uh, <laughs> something right now, I would look in those areas and think how, how do I make actually 
something for for that problem that that works mm. that actually gets job done like if i have awesome content it's relatively easy for me to get it distributed to the to the relevant audience organically not you know by buying clicks and everything there is nothing wrong with buying clicks we actually you know when we have a really good piece of content we will pay money to do advertising nothing wrong with it but you need first organic push to get initial audience to at least understand if it's a good content. Yeah, yeah, totally. Gene, first of all, um, thank you. This has been great in hearing your insights. Um, I have one last port, two questions I ask, um, but everyone should check out semrush.com, uh, sellerly.com, S-E-L-L-E-R-L-Y.com. Um, for it's actually free. You know, I don't know why they offer for free. Maybe they should start charging. Maybe they will start charging at some point, but it seems like they always have a freemium to what they do because they want to add value first. So check out uh, their two sites. And um, Eugene, I always ask, since it's Inspired Insider, what has been one of the lowest moments for you um, and how you push through? And then on the flip side, what's been a proud moment in your your journey so far? What's been uh, a low moment you had to push through? Yeah. So, so when you when you say low, you mean like I w- it was just emotionally kind of yeah. devastating in a way. Ah, yeah. Okay, that's that's easy. Yeah, because um, we always talk about oh, they raised they have four million users, forty million dollars. It wasn't always like that for people, right? They came from something that was hard, you know. Yeah, I think I think low low probably like psychologically low, my lowest moment was um, when I was in college. Uh, I had to to work uh, because like my my parents could not support me, you know, through through this. So I had to work, and um, um, you know, because I had to work, I didn't always have a lot enough enough time to study, and then. Um, when, when when I had exams, I really didn't have a lot of time to prepare. So so I had to kind of do this overnight. So almost no sleep, and um, and and one of the most important exams, I still failed it. It was actually a very tough exam, and I was probably not really good at this area <laughs> of science. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I just failed exam, and and the whole situation was like if I. If I fail exam one more time, um, I, they, they, will, they would kick, out, kick me out. Uh, out of college and also out of uh, dorm apartment. Uh, and I could not afford any other housing in that city, so I would have to kind of go back. Um, and I didn't sleep already for a long time, and then I couldn't couldn't have you know sleep till till the next exam because i needed to prepare and like a lot of you know things at that point of my life was stake so so that was probably psychologically like one of those moments where like i i had like really bad thoughts about what what i'm going to do if i fail with this exam it sounds yet again like now when i look at this that doesn't even seem to be a problem like that just so, so, some kind of someone a weenie teenager thinking about you know his problems no, no, nothing really serious there uh but yeah back in the day it felt like really life-changing thing uh, you know failing some exam um i think i think the 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 highest the highest moment was uh you know when when we uh kind of sold first portfolio company uh that was I think exceptional experience was really complicated deal. I was really involved with that with that company, and um, you know when we finally did it, I didn't even have any emotions left, but it, it felt really really good. From that point, I know I knew like okay, if we sold this company, we are probably really good at selling companies, and and I can do this kind of because uh, it was so for a complicated. Long time. That, that, yeah, 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 because. Because, yeah, exactly. Because the, the, there was no kind of, um, kind of, kind of, you know, no no consensus between investors and founders on what 
you know, we want to do. So it was complicated. Eventually, like now we are all friends. At that point, it was tough. So I was thinking, okay, if we came through all this and we sold the company, we're really good at it. So, so that actually can be my profession because, you know, I was at that point associate in a first time VC firm. So it's, it's kind of either, either you can do this or not, even, even you sometimes can have doubts like, okay, maybe I'm just trying to do something I cannot do. Like I'm not you know, made for this. And when, once we did this deal, I was, I, I knew like, yeah, that's, that's can be my profession till, till the end of my life. I, I'm actually good at it. Um, but yeah, yet again, in the, in this case, we, we work with great people. I mean, we, we, as I said, still great relationship with, with founders. They're awesome guys. Um, and, uh, the partner, you know, my, my partner at the firm, we still close as friends. So you still believed though in the SEM or so much that you almost changed careers in a sense, right? Oh yeah, sure. And, and I mean, like knowing, knowing the whole thing now, I, the, the only regret I have, I haven't done this early because I knew all like for a while before, you know, we actually had this conversation. And I joined the firm, uh, the, you know, SEM rush, but I knew guys for, you know, I, I think at least two years more like before that. So I, I need to check specific date, but, but I knew them and I like my only regret, I haven't done this earlier. And, um, yeah, it's it's more like I, I probably regret more um, kind of not not recognizing is in this and staying more in VC versus going <laughs> earlier in, uh, in you know, to work in SM Rush. It was like such 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 uh, such an opportunity that that happens, you know, sometimes once once in a lifetime. Um and as I said, as an investor, I've seen many businesses. I had a chance to be kind of part of the big stories, but um, there are very few companies like this. And and what's even more important, there are very few companies where uh, you really like to work with people that much. It's um, you know sometimes it's a great business. But it's, you know it's just business. You know you you come come to work, do your job, go home. Uh, there are no like uh, relationships, and I think SEM Raj, for me, uh, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, like family, and, and yet again, I think my only regret I didn't join earlier. Hmm. Uh, guys was definitely into something. It was you know, writing the writing was all over the wall, and I just decided to stay in VC longer. And I mean, you know, we did we did great things uh, with with Target. Um, was was tremendous experience. People I've met and worked with, uh, yeah, you know, also have have very good relations with them. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that was you know, SEM Rush was very different opportunity. Yeah, and you know, Eugene, thank you, thank you, everyone. Check out SEMRush.com, Sellerly.com. I'm gonna be the first one, Eugene. Thank you so much, and uh, hopefully we'll hang out in Chicago. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good one. Yeah.